I would like to call my good friend, I feel like she's my good friend by now, Valerie Courtois to come up here. And we have Miles Richardson, Rael McKenzie, um, Herb Norwegian, Herb. Who am I missing? Also, I'm Elder Anne Marie yeah. Andre. Yeah. Elder Anne Marie Andre. Excuse me if I'm really butchering up your names. Sean Charles Pietacho. There's a chief for you. Let's just make our own way. This panel is on guardians and nationhood, and I will turn the moderation over to Valerie Courtois. Thank you, Leah. Isn't Leah doing a great job? Yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce this panel. You heard me refer to this concept of guardians strengthening our nationhood, and of course, I have never been an elected leader uh, in that sense, and I, or, or really, you know, I come from a forestry background as a technician, honestly. Um, and uh, I thought it would be a great uh, idea to hear from leaders about why they, as leaders, are supporting this vision and this national movement. So at this time, I have the great honor of, of introducing Mr. Miles Richardson, who is a senior advisor of the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, and we're very proud to have him on, on our advisor panel. Uh, he's also the uh, executive director of the National Consortium for Indigenous Economic Development at the University of Victoria, as well as the former leader of the Haida Nation. So, Miles, please join us. How uh, Val for that introduction, and I want to also to um, thank Leah George Wilson for the her great job as chairing, and to thank her people, the Tsleil-Waututh, and all the Coast Salish people for wel welcoming us here this morning so graciously as they always do, and very importantly for leading us and to to begin our work in proper ceremony. With the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, one thing we, we stand for and one principle that we came together to advocate is Indigenous nationhood. And one common characteristic that our people have, and I believe is why we can still stand today after hundreds of generations, after thousands of years as our people, and proclaim who we are, is because our people understand the importance of leading and conducting our business in proper ceremony. And to Elder Dave Corshane for always leading us so clearly and coherently and, and with such strength in that area. I want to thank you, Dave, for that. I mean, I could sit down right now. All of you know what I'm going to say. Uh, in, in this, um, as we've developed the Guardians Initiatives, it's been a, I've been like a broken record around nationhood and asserting our sovereignty. And really, that's my message today. And I, I know we have, um, Grand Chief, ex-Grand Chief, I see, I didn't know about that. Herb Norwegian fr from the Decho, who, he still looks like a young guy, but you know, at one time I was a young leader and he was, I considered him my mentor in terms of nationhood and in terms of the paramountcy of standing up and protecting our lands. And I know in those days, I took inspiration and encouragement from what the Dene Nation and the Decho were doing in those days. So I think we're very lucky and I feel very privileged to share a 
panel with, with Herb Norwegian. You know, when I talk about nationhood, and when we talk about this Guardians Network, which we're just beginning to pull our common vision together on, I, I think of why the Indigenous Leadership Initiative came together. It's a, it's a group of, of um, shall I say, seasoned leaders who no longer have any authority coming together for a singular purpose, to support and advocate Indigenous nationhood. That's why the Indigenous Leadership Initiative came together, and that's our fundamental mandate that we work toward. And when I got involved, that initially was around Indigenous protected areas, around looking at parts of Canada that we wanted to protect, but there really wasn't the political will out there, except in, amongst Indigenous people. So we wanted to work with, partner with, and empower First Nations in their places, in their territories, to protect lands and marine areas. And that became a strong push. And if you see now, Canada has signed on to many UN and international declarations with objectives through Canada's Pathways Initiative for protecting lands and waters. I think the one that runs out in 2020 is 17% terrestrial, meaning lands and inland waters, and 10% marine. A couple of years ago, they found out we're not even close to those numbers. How are we going to get there? So they put together a group of indigenous leaders and said, why don't we partner with indigenous nations and I think we're going to come close to meeting those targets with indigenous leadership. Canada is smart to smell the coffee in terms of indigenous people's commitment to responsible stewardship. That's why we can stand in front of you, being the living generation of hundreds of generations, of thousands of years in our respective territories. I know the Heltsuk this morning reminded us that they have scientific confirmation that they've been in their territory for over 14,000 years. That's similar amongst our people, the Haida Nation. And one reason we, we are still here is because of that protecting our, our territories. And that brings me back to when I was a young Haida leader, just coming, and I come by that ethic um, honestly. I was a young Haida leader just getting out of school and came home and I guess my people thought I knew something from because I had a university degree and I, I got elected president of our nation, of the Haida nation and came in and had a look at what was going on. Did I see Gujao in here? Oh yeah, he's gonna keep me honest. You know I'm telling the truth. Gujao was our president for years after me, so he'll attest to this story. Anyway, we were, we were um, trying to figure out what we needed to do as the current generation of leaders of the Haida Nation. We looked at, you know, the comprehensive claims negotiations had just begun. This was in the early 80s. The Nishkas were negotiating, and our negotiators had economists in, and they were tallying up all the trees that they'd taken from Haida Gwaii over the years, and all the fish, and all the minerals. And that strategy, I think, was to send Canada and BC a bill for those. And I remember sitting down with our elders in the face of all this, with pesticides being sprayed on our islands, the last tree being threatened to cut. They were getting ready to drill for oil and gas in our oceans off our shore. It was a crisis. And here we were, young leaders, figuring out what to do with this. And I'll never forget what our elders told us. They said, you know, 
for 150 years, for almost 200 years, we've been trying to get along with these people. We've been trying to explain to them their own law, their own proper way, and it hasn't worked. Our generation may not survive if they drill for oil and gas. You know what your mandate is? Haida, Council of the Haida Nation? You have to protect Haida Gwaii. You have to protect our life source. You must stop the destruction of our life source. Who cares what kind of checks we get from Ottawa and Victoria? That's not what made us Haida. That's not what made our people who we are. It's our relationship to our homelands. So that became our mandate. So we went out and did 25 or 30 years ago what many of, of you have done across the country, what I was watching the Dene do. We laid out, as they did, our own land use plans under our own jurisdiction and our own authority. And we told them where they're gonna, they have to quit logging. We told them how, how management had to be over fishing. We told them what the rules were for the intertidal zone. We told them what areas they were not gonna touch that were gonna be protected in their natural state forever. And they laughed at us. But that plan became our mandate. And we blockaded, we went to court, we did many things. Many of the same things many of you are doing. And Canadians and British Columbians and people around the world believed our story, believed our truth, and came and stood with us. So in, in um, I think, that, uh, the early 90s, we signed the Guayanas Agreement with the Government of Canada, which covered about an eighth of the land base of Haida Gwaii, which was a First Nation to Nation agreement. Not agreeing on, but recognizing we shared title. And in 2010, Gujao signed an agreement, an unprecedented agreement with Premier Horgan's predecessor, Gordon Campbell. I don't know if it's kosher to say that in the same breath. <laughs> but he signed an agreement as president of the Haida Nation for all of the rest of the land area on Haida Gwaii, every square inch for joint decision making. Again, they couldn't, they wouldn't recognize our title, but they certainly came to terms that it existed and that the plans that we made under our own authority, our own unilaterally asser asserted authority, they legislated into provincial law, which gave us, we didn't, um, have any land use issues to fight about. So when we talk about, when we look at our respective nationhood across this country, I'm telling you it can be done. You know, and if we can define our nationhood that's defining our people and our territory and our laws and stand on in that truth ourselves, our own truth, our own story, our own narrative, and ask other people to respect that, I believe everything will change. I believe Premier Horgan would come to the table with those who want to, to do that. I believe we can bring joint decision-making agreements to, to true reconciliation where the laws that govern our respective territories are consented to by us and reflect our values. The ILI looked at this new government in Ottawa when they were proclaiming a new indigenous relations policy called a, nation, a proper nation-to-nation -nation relationship. This was at the start of their mandate. When was that, 2011, 2012? 2015. And um, they said, we're committed to establishing a proper nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Up till that time, they, their policy, driven by the Indian Act and the Comprehensive Claims Policy, was a colonial policy, 
meant to deny our humanity, deny our entitlement, deny our relationship to our homelands. Now they were saying, let's get along. The ILI recognized that and said, good policy. We can work out a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. That's the proper way forward. Why not begin on a positive note? Why not begin with making can Canada's ethic around responsible stewardship based on our in respective Indigenous ethics? Let's start there. We got enough to fight about. We got pipelines, we got all these other issues we're going to fight about as we move toward reconciliation. But on responsible stewardship, we can work together. So we set that objective as the ILI and Val and her team went out and you heard the story. How many meetings you have on Parliament Hill? 200? And persuaded the Environment Committee, the Finance Committee and just through a heck of a lot of work of laying out this vision to support our initiative. And we asked, we said this is going to take $500 million to begin. Reconciliation is going to take new levels of financing. And all they came up with in 2017's budget was um, 25 for planning for a pilot project. But the minister agreed with us. She looked us in the eye and said, we are going to do this in the spirit of the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, and we're going to do this in partnership. And you hold the pen. And a partnership meant this wasn't going to be a federal program where they dole out money to grease their agenda. It meant we were going to develop an initiative that respected indigenous authority on the ground. And we were going to work together to build that relationship in, in um, environmental monitoring, in, in um, getting elders and youth out on the ground, in whatever vision you had. There's many, there's 30 programs that exist across this country and we wanted to find out what we hold in common to, to build this initiative. If I had more time, I'd tell you the gruesome story. But the joint working group that just reported, let me say it nicely, I won't say it as nicely as Val did, we're not there yet. It's a work in progress. But we're... At the end of this meeting, we'll put together a business case for the 500 million that we'll get as wholly as we can to your initiatives, to your guardians' initiatives on the ground. All you need to do, and this is, comes much easier to say, define your nationhood in a modern way. Indian Act bans are a legacy of the colonial system. If you want to empower them to be the modern definition of your nation, I'm not going to argue with you, that's your business. But I don't see that as a nation. That's been my experience. Our nations are based on our ancient traditions, our common cultural ways, our common languages, and jurisdiction over contiguous territories. Once you do that, we can pull this together. And what we need to do in collectively, and that's all of you, this is moving quickly out of the ILI's hands, as it should. This group is taking over through this working group. We need to make those plans. We need to pull this together. And I think after this gathering, we need a series of um, 10 regional sessions. Regional Chief Terry Teejee has showed a lot of leadership through the AFN, and I know he'll bring the rest of the AFN into this discussion so that we can complete this work. But I think we're on to a really strong initiative. It must be Indigenous-led. And Premier Horgan, I think as we go through out regionally, I'm really encouraged that you're here today. I hope we can find ways to work together in British Columbia between your government and indigenous nations on responsible stewardship. 
All of our future depends on it, not only for climate change, the salmon crisis in this, on this coast, all of these issues that we have in common, we're best to address them together on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Thank you, Val, for allowing me the time, and I look forward to a, a question period toward the end. How are? How uh, Miles? At this time, it's my great honor to introduce uh, members of my own nation, of uh, the Nation Inu. I would like to uh, invite uh, Chief Jean-Charles Pietachot, Elder Anne-Marie André, and uh, political advisor Réal Mackenzie. Réal is also a former chief of the community of Matimikos to join me. Now, Jean-Charles Pietachot is going to address uh, his talk and, and Elder and Marie in Inu Emun, or in our Inu language, and Real is going to provide the translation. And so at this time, I'd like to uh, invite them all to come to the podium. Wenn <laughs> Nija <laughs> Uh, as usual, um, it's not easy to trans to make the job as a translator, right? I'm not a professional, so uh, first of all, Chief uh, Pietasho, uh, it's very pleased and honored to be here. He said, like my name, uh, his family name is Pietasho, meaning our Inu language, traveling with the wind. So we always traveling with the wind, so I uh, go from coast to coast. So uh, first of all, Chief Pitash wants to introduce his uh, uh, position. He just uh, related to that uh, resolution to convert the AFN in year 2015, when we supported that resolution. Moi had quit to Tmat Jigan Tan at Japan, Ninan quit Tabe Yat at sea. Nin, the new e, the sea, Puni Yanto won't drive it. Puhejen, Monoji, Hegapoyan, the Jispirat man at sea. I won't pay you. Mac, my word to Tmas you won. Jantin Watinan, Jen, Jetwasim Nan. Josemanan, Janaskutabanan, no tum. Jewi mammit named the mah, Yanaga would take a mammit named Dasina, no to Tarinan to Mohomna. This is uh, another thing I will, I will be very proud to tell you here. I uh, wasn't born in a hospital like today, to the modern. So he was born in the home traditional land, in the bush. So that's my identity where I come from, he said. And also, I just forgot to add uh, at the beginning, therefore, as we know this year, it's uh, international Aboriginal uh, languages, okay? Chief Yetashu always 
speak in our own language. It's not because we don't speak in French, you can. But here we are uh, in <laughs> Vancouver, so French is not usual here in this province. And so uh, you always express on your own language. The reason why the Inu nation still speaking 100% on our own language. But when we look at our generations, the kids coming behind us, starting to losing, and seriously. So we have to work hard to keep these, or kids, to keep uh, speaking uh, on our own language, Inu language. And uh, secondly, he said, uh, that generation we're talking about, or youth, we must have to, to give that same tran uh, transmission what our elders transmitted to us to keep, protect our uh, house. The, he called it uh, treasure land, his house. Everything is, is in there, not just the re status re reservation. It's not his home, he said. It's the home, traditional land is my house, where I feed us forever. Also, his, um, um, his grandfather, his father, and himself, they were a chief. Chief Etashu was re-elected uh, last uh, fall. It's 20, 26 years straight elected. His dad before, 22 years consecutively and the grandfather. So from grandfather, the father, and him, I guess his own people like him. <laughs> I don't see anything else <laughs> if he was related so many times, and the father. Oh, by the way, if you look, or uh, just uh, have a, a quick look there for our Inu, Inu land. There's nine Inu community on the Quebec side. And you can see the two Inu community on the Labrador side. I come from, from uh, Matimekush, right in the middle. That's my, my community. And Chief Itashus come from this place here, Ekwanchit. That's where you come from. So we're 11 uh, communities. Population, roughly about 20, 20, 24,000 members altogether. So if you look the land there, it's very spread and huge lands, over 750,000 uh, kilometers square. And before 1949, we didn't have that problem with that border when it created in 1949. Today, the Inu from Quebec and also the Inu from Labrador created us a lot of problems because of the border. Federal government never, never uh, respected that rights we had on the both side before the, the border was created. So it's important to mention that because uh, our traditional activities, we did, we didn't recognize the, the border, it, one or the other. So the second thing what the chief was uh, adding here when he was talking about his own language, he says it's very, very important too, uh, <laughs> because of the program what we're discussing here for the guardian of the territory, I guess that the, that's the youth gonna have to take it over. But our jobs, elders, transmit, transmitted the real way, the traditional way, what our fathers used to do. When <laughs> Mani, Ehoga, Nagatogot, Hojite Homogne, Nenem Stamino, Chinano, Japano, Nemanigan, Neguetua, Gigi to Tate Ginano, Abu to Ebanega, Canaga to Abataga, Sino, Potosi, he won, Ipoto, Joga had Nak, Tantem Teban, Omenu Jiga Hagat, Tewat, 
And also, Chief Yetashu, I uh, just forgot uh, one of the parts that he was uh, asking to say. It's uh, the UN uh, or UN uh, battle, all rights on that level. He says it's very important to keep that all together. When I said together, you talk about unity. And sometimes or many nations cross uh, from coast to coast. We certainly have some division of our own nations. Today we have no choice to unite that forces we need to go ahead with our people and really defend it as well, our rights on any level. That's what uh, Chief Yetashu uh, wants to express to you. And he's very kind, of, once again, he's very kind to be here. And, uh, and like he said, I hope that that guard wing, oh yeah, yeah he, said, he said to me there at the table, I guess he forgot it, but uh, he says, uh, my special request will be for next gathering, if you're gonna hold it in, on the Quebec, Quebec region, if that's possible. <laughs> so, he thanks you. Bonjour, monsieur, et bonjour toute la table des, des grands monsieur. Et je félicite beaucoup, beaucoup les gardiens. Et je félicite aussi un cri Nascapi qui est ici aujourd'hui. Il est seul de sa communauté. Il était à côté de nous autres, à Matmekouche, complètement au milieu, de, au milieu de la province de Québec. Moi, je viens de la nation Inno, dont les chasseurs faisaient la, la, la visite circulaire. Ils, ils suivaient le, le caribou. Ils géraient le caribou, ils vivaient du caribou. Ils, ils faisaient toutes les les outils, les habits, les toiles et tout, tout, on vivait du caribou et aussi on avait, les chasseurs, les vrais chasseurs avaient une connexion directe avec les esprits du caribou qui est Pepacassu et l'esprit euh, des poissons qui est le snack. Et c'est tous ces, euh, ces deux esprits maîtres, les chasseurs l'avaient en eux. Et plus tu respectais ta chasse, plus tu avais, tu avais la chance pour tuer beaucoup, beaucoup d'animaux, de, de, des, des animaux en fourrure, ton manger et tout pour la survie de, de ta famille. Et un jour, je suis allée voir, je suis rentrée dans une maison, puis il y avait un aîné. Ok, ok, j'arrive. Le monsieur me dit, il dit, je rentre, c'est un vieux. Il dit, tu vois, il dit, il dit ça c'est un os de caribou. Il dit, moi je me sers de cet os pour m'envoler, aller à la chasse du caribou. Quand il y a de la famine pour le bien de la communauté. Et il dit, je reviens avec un petit caribou pour, euh, avec euh, mon os. Elle dit, je te le donne, parce qu'un jour, ça va t'aider. Et je ne savais pas que c'était aujourd'hui que ça allait m'aider. Et c'était juste euh, pour vous montrer, il y a très, très longtemps, que nos aînés à nous autres, il y avait une connexion directe avec les aînés, avec les esprits. Et aussi, il faut que ça continue dans les apprentissages avec les gardiens qu'on qu va avoir. C'était le message que je voulais vous laisser. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le ministre, encore. Premier ministre Premier ministre. Ouais, <rire> Quand, euh, je voulais savoir comment on dit euh, en français euh, « chemshkut ».« Chemshkut » en français Oui. Euh, oui, « chemshkut ». Mais c'est quoi la traduction Grand-père. 
Tu m'as dit? Quelle chose? Attends, mais oui, Le grand cassa. Le grand cassa. Tu sais, mais je crois. Tu sais, je vais te laisser traduire après. Just, um, uh, Helder said, um, uh, when you have a, a, a leader, a leader uh, title, like you, Grand Chief, uh, National Chief, on our Inno language, uh, we call it uh, Mr. Mishra, uh, the, the, uh, the great beaver, the, 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 the buzz beaver. I don't know how to translate that, but <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Check, check, there you go. I'm going to do a really quick summary of, of, of what uh, Elder and Marie uh, had to share um, because I was asked to do that. Um, so Anne Marie introduced herself as, as a woman from um, Matsime Koch as well, from, as an Inu woman. Anne Marie has been a, a long time language teacher. In fact, she's been my personal spiritual guide for a number of years. And um, she talked about how the guardians are really at the root of, of an expression of who we are. And, and, um, and she's very, very pleased to see this come to fruition. In fact, this is a representation of, of, of who she's been uh, as a teacher for a number of years. Um, and on, on the bone that she made reference to, the Inu are, are caribou people. And this is, this is a bone of the caribou that an elder Uh, offered to her a number of years back and said, this is going to be important and useful for you one day. And little did she know that today was that day that that bone would be useful for her and uh, would be a part of guiding her in her words that she shared with you today. So in summary, uh, that is what the, the elder had to share. So, Chinishkubit, now, for your partage and your paroles sage. Merci. And at this moment, uh, of course, last but of course not least, I have the great honor of introducing Herb Norwegian. Herb, I believe we first met uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, yeah, I'm aging myself a little bit here, but um, yes, it's, I've, I've known Herb for a long time and I've been a long time admirer of the work of the Decho First Nations, in particular of their work on their land use plan. In fact, I'm a professional planner and I still, to this day, consider the Decho land use plan as, as the benchmark, as the example um, of land use planning in, in this country. And Herb was the chair of, of the commission, <coughs> excuse me, that led that planning effort. And, and of course, it was, as it was a grand chief of the Decho First Nations a number of years and um, is now, uh, has now agreed to, to join us and talk about his vision as, as a longtime leader of the Decho First Nation and as a leader who has advocated for the protection and conservation of his own lands and, and has inspired many from across the country. So Herb, please, uh, please welcome uh, Herb Norwegian. Thank you. Thanks for the beautiful introduction. Uh, just a couple of quick things I want to say. First of all, I want to thank the uh, coastal people for inviting us to their territory to have this important discussion. It's something that uh, that we all uh, have close to our hearts, uh, taking care of our lands and uh, taking care of our waters. And again, I want to thank the coastal people for uh, inviting us to this great, uh, great part of the country. Also with me, I have a, uh, a group of young people that are traveling with me from uh, up in my territory. We have one uh, harvester uh, and also a guardian, uh, something like about uh, 30 of them that were trained last summer. And one of them is here with us today. So if we could, if you could rise, if I mention your name, uh, Troy Ruttle, could you stand there? That's one of our guardians, yes. And he's also my, uh, my trapping buddy. Him and I, we run traps here every whole winter there last, this winter here. And we have two young programmers. Uh, uh, Kristen Tanche, could you rise, please? And then Nicole Hardesty. Yeah. And of course, uh, we, we can't uh, 
go without uh, this one here. I, ha I have with me also an elder, uh, Jonas Antoine. Could you rise there, Jonas Antoine? <laughs> also a harvester. Uh, you know, he calls himself everything. He calls himself a philosopher, but I just call him Jonas. Eh? He's a good man. We trap together. Uh, knows the territory inside out. I learned a lot from him. Again, uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers, all you people for bringing this together. Uh, the work that I have done over the last few years is really incredible. Uh, you know, I was only something like about a 20-year-old kid when I first got dragged into this. Uh, I'm a, a mechanic by trade. You know, you get your hands dirty and that's the kind of work that I've, I'm in. I've done that for about five years and a group of elders have grabbed my heels from underneath a vehicle and dragged me out and said, Herb, from here you're gonna go to meetings for us. And I said, what? I'm, what kind of meeting is this? Well, he said, is, you're, you're gonna be speaking on the land for us. You speak the language. We know your father. You come from an important family. We want you to speak for us. Go to that meeting now, they said. So, off I went, and I never looked back. And you know, today I, I look back at when I actually started, and I started counting back the years. You know, I've been at this, what, almost 40 years now, you know, and I thought, God, that's, that's a long time, and I keep thinking that, you know, this, this kind of thing has got to end sometime, but you know, it just <laughs> takes off, you know? You say you're going to take a break, and now I'm out of uh, the elected uh, position. I've uh, been out of it for almost a year, and I thought, this is it. It's going to be retirement, and it's going to be straight, you know, green grass from here. Not, not a hoping hell. I mean, this is, and, and most of you that have retired, you know how this is. You, you step back, and right away they know the work that you've done, what you've been involved in. They get their claws in you, and they pull you away from it. And that's what I'm doing here. I mean, they gave me only some like about three days' notice, and uh, I'm here speaking to a front group of people. So, again, it, it's enjoyable. I mean, this work that we do on the land and take care of uh, the, the very sacred thing that that uh, has given us uh, this job here to take care of our land is important, you know? And uh, the, the work that we're doing here with the guardianship is also a really important piece of work. You know, I keep it close to my heart because I'm out there. I uh, trap, I'm a harvester, I hunt moose, caribou, set nets underneath the ice. Just done that there a couple of weeks ago, and this is, a, this is my life. So when we ask uh, people about, are you a guardian? Well, I mean, I'm a natural guardian because I have, I'm like, like our young lady here with the moccasins here. We have, we've got to keep our moccasins on the ground if we're going to protect our, our, our land. And that's what this is all about. That's what this whole movement is about. It's about putting moccasins back on the land. And I think if we keep that in mind, I think we're hitting the right direction. And so, you know, the things that we do is important. It's, it's uh, the things that I've done over the last few years is, uh, one of them is, uh, you know, we expanded the Nahani National Park something like about seven times. You know, it's just an incredible piece of work. Somebody said that would never ever happen in our lifetime. And, you know, we took it and we said, we've got to do it. And of course, it's driven by the Dato people. We are the ones that took that agenda and said, we're going to do it. And uh, today, the Nahani Park has expanded seven times. And uh, we're really proud to say that the Nahani is a sister park to the Guayanas, the great uh, Queen Charlotte area. And uh, we've used that as a model, and we've uh, continued. And uh, today, there's another park in our area, the Thai Dene, the Slusoke people have just created another park, uh, something that will be signed off this, uh, this spring, I believe. Uh, and of course, you know, we in the Dash Show, we've created an incredible area. The uh, Edeji was signed off last, uh, last fall with uh, Canada. And uh, the Edeji is an interesting uh, piece of work because it's a, uh, it's a plateau, it's a mountain, uh, roughly about half the size of Prince Edward Island. It's got uh, 50 fish lakes on top of this, you know, 3,000 feet up there. 
And it's like the Himalayas. It's this mountain, and it's got these lakes up there. Now, people would ask, how does water get up there? You know, there's no creeks or anything draining into it because that's the highest part. But where it gets all its water from is from rain, and it also has these aqueducts uh, underneath that flow from underneath the ground, and that's what keeps these lakes just pristine clear. Uh, you could see rocks down below there at 50 feet water. I mean, this is the kind of area we're talking about. But um, last year, uh, last fall, we finally brought this, uh, this whole initiative to a head, and we finally signed it off. And uh, why, it's, why this area is, is so important, it's a, a place of refuge. Uh, when I say refuge, you've got to re go back thousands of years ago when our people, you know, were just crawling the mountainsides and, you know, the big valleys. There are thousands and thousands of people living off the land. And uh, in the Detro territory, it was no different. We, uh, we had a lot of people living there, I mean, a pristine area people harvesting moose, but there were times in the middle of the winter when uh, the resources would be de depleted. The moose would be gone, the caribou would be gone, the rabbits, the chicken, and then there would all of a sudden be, you know, this sudden shock that, you know, we've got to do something. And of course, the winters are, what, 60, 70 below back in those days. So, you know, they get organized and People pulled together with their little dog teams and sleighs, and there'd be a parade, a caravan of people that would head towards the Edeji, this mountain blue mountain in the area of about probably about 60 miles from the Mackenzie River. And they would just pack each other. It's almost like the people in the deserts and you know, down in uh, Ethiopia and places where they're just parading. But this is in the snowbank and the cold temperatures and they would get to these areas and they would get to the top and they're after this one particular lake and Jonas and I, we went there and it's this one place called uh, the Willow Lake at the Shikei Tree, it's a large lake. Uh, they have to go to this particular place because there's this two points that come together in this large lake and right in the middle there, this ice is only about two inches thick the rest of the lake, the ice is about six feet thick, but they have to get to this spot. The little dog teams would be packing and they're pulling their sleighs and they would get to this spot. They take their little flint or, you know, bone chisel, they would get to this spot here. A couple of people would walk out there. Everybody's waiting on the shoreline and they take their chisel and they start pounding the ice. They could hear the ice responding back to them like a drum. It's hollow down in there. And they would get to this place and then they punch a little hole in the ice and all of a sudden there'd be air comes out. It's incredible. I mean, Jonas and I, we didn't believe it, but it happened to us. And so all of a sudden they start clearing out the ice to make a little hole in the water. It's probably about four feet deep and the area is probably, there's a channel, probably from that wall to that wall and they would, somebody, in the, in the tribe would be packing a net. Now I'm talking about a net, a traditional net. We're not talking nylon woven net. We're talking about a willow bark net that was made out of stripping these little strands of willow from the bark and they would roll it up and they would make these nets. And it's an incredible piece of work because you'd have to think somebody would have to spend days on doing that. but. One person would be carrying this bag of wet little willows. And then they would give it to him. He would take it and with a bunch of little sticks, he would string it underneath the ice. And the dogs and the people and everybody are watching all of this here. There's no breathing. Nobody is just silent. They get that little net underneath the ice. No sooner does the net get to the end and all of a sudden the net is just jerking, eh? And everybody says, Daddy, there's something there, you pull it back out. So they start pulling their net back out. Right off the bat, a big trunk falls on the ice. It's a fluff. A whitefish, a jack. All of a sudden, there's just a whole pile of fish that are coming out. Everybody is yelling, yeah, the dogs are barking. And of course, they, everybody grabs a meal, make the fire. And, you know, everybody eats, even the poor dogs that were hauling people up there, 
them too have a big feast. And so everybody's happy, and that's what a day's year was to us. It, that's what it meant to us. It brought life back into our souls. And it was incredible because uh, in those days, I mean, it was, life was tough. But um, when people were out there, they actually worked pretty hard. My uh, grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, when, when he was about uh, in his early, probably early teens, he said, he said they did a similar kind of a trek, he says. Way in the middle of uh, the winter, he says there's a whole tribe from the Rabbitskin River area had uh, taken off and he says there was an elder there that had his own teepee and he had all his little birch bark uh, pots. They hauled everything up and they, they got halfway up the mountain and uh, they were ready to leave again the next couple of nights. The old guy had his teepee there with his little caribou hide teepee and everybody was going and getting ready to leave the next morning and he calls all the elders and the women together under, in his teepee. And he says, uh, they all got together wondering, what is he going to be telling them? This guy's old already. You know, he's in his very senior years, barely moving around. But he was able to get in the foothills of the Adagio. Now, they get together, and, and then he fed them dry meat, and everybody talked a little bit. And he said, yes, he said, I want to tell you that today, he says, I decide I'm going to stay here. I'm not going on to the top of the Adagio with, with you people, I'm going to stay behind. And he says, um, when I stay behind, I've got my little wood pile, I've got my little dry meat, and so I've got a little bit of food, so don't worry about me, I've got my blanket. He says, don't worry about me, I'm gonna be okay. But, he says, you, the rest of you, continue your journey to the fish hole. And, uh, don't bother coming back through this area where my tent is going to be. Make a detour and pass this area about a couple of kilometers around it. He says, don't come to this area, just stay away from it for two years, he says. And my grandfather, being a young kid, you know, he would take off and the old guy stayed there with his teepee, smoldering low fire and we left him there, we take off, he says. We get to uh, a deji and uh, we did our harvest and everybody was well into just, you know, making dry fish, you know, which is a happy time. And spring came, the ice had gone, and then people started heading back to the lowlands and to the, the river. My grandfather says, there's that spot there, that old guy had lived on. I wonder if we should check it out. And the people that were traveling with him said, don't bother, just leave him. But anyways, for, this went on for about four or five years, he says. And then finally he got into his 20s, you know, he was hunting around with snowshoes, looking for moose in the wintertime, and he thought, well, he was close to the area. It's well into five years, now I should go over there and go check it out. So he snowshoes to the area, and in these lofty trees, with spruce trees, hang, hanging snow, all in the whole area there, he comes out into this open where they had their camp. And lo and behold, here is these teepee poles, just weathered teepee poles still standing there. No cover, there's no canvas, there's no caribou hide around it. Just teepee, teepee pole there. He walks up, he looks around, and it was just straight snow in that whole area. He, said. he walks into the teepee area, kicks around the snow, and he could see the rocks around in the center. He kicks around and he felt in the, in the area, he, says he could feel the ashes down in there. And he felt into the, the side of the teepee area. And he said, oh, he felt was straight uh, dried spruce boughs. Nothing, no blankets, nothing. Thought maybe he'd find something, like maybe a skeleton or something. But he said he checked the whole area, nothing, he said. It was just amazing. So. So he leaves, and uh, when he got back to his community, his little rabbit skin community, he told the people that he did go there, and they said, you went there, we know you went there. He said, so what did you find? He says, uh, 
Nothing, he says. There was just great teepee poles. There was nothing. It was just flat. There was nothing, nothing there, he says. So then the elders, they sat and they said, yeah, well, that's good. He's traveled on. And what, what happened was he was old enough. He knew what was coming to him. He knew his days were numbered. And he accepted the fact. He accepted the what was going to happen to him for the next little while. He knew that was the end of his journey. And he accepted it and said uh, that he was going to stay. So he stayed and you know, he withered and passed on and nature took its course. But uh, the moral of all of this is that you know, there are many elders that have done the same kind of thing. The very same thing that we are walking on, the very thing that we're building on here today, is that every, every step that we take in the Altma land, whether it's up in the Adagia, the side hill of the mountain, an elder at one point had laid their life down. They had laid themselves down, kind of like a little cobblestone on a street, so that the next generation of young people from behind can parade up these beautiful areas and continue to use those kinds of areas. So when we talk about these pristine areas that need protection, understand that there was an elder there that had laid himself down in these areas, in these incredible areas. And that's what this is all about. This is about us continuing our journey. I mean, we have this incredible pyramid, this incredible you know, a place that we need to be going. And uh, I think we, we together have got this incredible job and that's meant to happen. I mean, it's not something that we planned it. We're all together here because something inside us told us that what we're doing is the right thing. And I think if you build on that, then I think we're, we're heading all the same direction. So with that, you know, I, again, I want to thank you for listening to me. I know I could, they gave me a little note here, two minutes, they said, but I could go on forever. In closing, I just want to, again, acknowledge we have a, a guest here with us. Um, could you stand up? Maybe Mr. John Hogan is the, uh, the premier of uh, BC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's the premier of BC. The, He's the, uh, the super guardian of BC here, guys. <laughs> again, I want to thank you for listening to me. I could go on, but uh, again, I enjoyed meeting all of you. Again, let's uh, keep up the good work. Masicho. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you very much to this panel. Let's give them another round of applause. That was amazing. <laughs> Especially, no, I'm sorry, Miles, no we're um, a little bit out of time, so we don't have the opportunity for questions, but should you see any of them around the coffee, please feel free to give them, ask them a few questions. If I could ask Ginger to come up here and help me give a small token of our appreciation. And while we're doing that, just put the Ovid on notice that he's up next. Val said she's good. Okay. Can I call upon the Australian Rangers and over Mercury, our senior advisor, to please make their way to the front?
come on up. We have to. Um, Valerie is going to um, step in for Ovid until he returns. So um, thanks, everyone. And I'm uh, I'm certainly not Ovid Mercredi. And uh, it's very, very odd to be pitch hitting for, for Ovid, but I'm just going to step in until he's able to join us in the room. And it's my uh, great honor and privilege to welcome uh, Mr. Dennis Rose and Mr. Aaron Morgan um, uh, from Australia, of course, and they're both from uh, Gunjbara area in the Victoria State, uh, which is in the southern part of Australia. Dennis is a senior Gunjimara man whose commitment to protecting country is evident in his long history in Aboriginal land and cultural heritage management. Dennis worked for the Australian federal government in the 1990s and was instrumental in the development of the Indigenous Protected Areas Program. He is currently employed, employed as a project manager for the Gunjin, Gundinj Mering Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation. That's a, quite a word to pronounce. And Dennis was the chief executive officer with the Windamara Aboriginal Corporation in Haywood from 2002 until 2010. Dennis also worked as a ranger with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Gundijmara country includes wetlands, forests, and Bujdbin, a long dormant volcano which is central to a landscape of channels and wears through which Gundijmara people and in used indigenous methods to ensure a year-round supply of eels. The Bujinjbim landscapes are protected through the four indigenous protected areas, and the Bujinjbim cultural landscape is currently nominated for a World Heritage listing. Mr. Aaron Morgan is also a Gunjinjmara traditional owner, and he's 23 years of age. He's currently a senior Bujinjbim ranger with the female senior ranger, and manages up to 12 Bujinjbim rangers. Aaron has been a Bunjbin ranger for six years and enjoys looking after country, particularly protecting the cult cultural value of the Gunjinbara country. He's also proud to tell the Gunjinbara story to visitors and researching his own culture. So in terms of flow of this, uh, this session, we're going to have Dennis and, and Aaron join for a bit of a presentation. And then now that I've seen that Ovid has been able to join us, we'll have Ovid join for a bit of a Q&A um, with, uh, with our Australian friends. So please join me in welcoming Darren and Aaron. Dennis and Aaron. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, uh, thank you, Val. Thanks for that uh, uh, introduction. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, thank each and every one of you that are here today. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely honoured and proud to to be here to present the Australian uh, uh, experience. I certainly don't want to pretend that it's a, a perfect experience. There's certainly a lot of work that we have to do within Australia, but we have been going for 20 years in one program and, and 11 in the other, so we do have some experience there. Uh, Valerie, uh, this is a gathering, is it? I'm glad you said there wasn't going to be a large mop here because I'm a bit nervous here. And, but anyway, we'll, we'll get through it. Um, how do I do the presentation? This one? Just green? Okay. Uh, Na Hello. Bonjour. G'day. Uh, my name's Dennis Rose. Uh, we've already uh, had the introduction, but I am a uh, a project manager with our traditional owner group down home in southwest Victoria. Um, uh, Aaron will introduce himself in a, in a few minutes, but Aaron's uh, our senior male ranger um, and uh, he uh, works out on country. Uh, you won't see me digging a post hole or anything like that, but I'll be telling these young people uh, where to, where to uh, dig it. I'm going to present a bit of an overview of the national scene and then Aaron will uh, present on, on, on the work that he does, uh, so I'll, I'll get into it. So I'm going to talk about both the Indigenous Protected Areas Program and the Indigenous Rangers Program, as I mentioned, that have been going for a number of years in Australia. Just uh, to show you where uh, Gundichmara country is, you can see the red dot down the bottom, we're in southeast Australia. Uh, we're, we're on the coast and uh, we uh, have, a, have, a, have a large area with, within the Gundichmara nation. <laughs> Um, and uh, we, we own and, and manage around about 3,000 hectares of country that we have 
uh, legal title to. The Commonwealth, the Federal Indigenous Protected, Pro Protected Areas Program is established in uh, the, the late 1990s. Um, it's been going for a bit over 20 years. It was, it was uh, first initiated uh, primarily to uh, um, uh, add to what they call the National Reserve System, so to include a number of uh, protected areas within different regions in Australia. Uh, some regions had a, a large number of bioregions. Uh, some regions had very few uh, bio re uh, protected areas, sorry. Um, and what, they, what the federal government found was that some of those regions uh, were, were largely or wholly uh, Aboriginal owned and uh, um, Aboriginal people weren't going to give up their land uh, to, uh, to back to the government after uh, having, having uh, battles over the years with land rights and, 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 and later uh, native title. Uh, so it was a, a program decided to devise to uh, have a voluntary declaration of protected areas uh, on, on Aboriginal owned land and uh, being funded accordingly. Uh, it, it started off with a series of pilot projects um, uh, around the country, I think similar to what we're hearing today, uh, uh, one or two projects in each state and, te in each state and territory, um, and that's gradually built up over the years, in the last 20 years, that there are now 75 Indigenous protected areas throughout Australia, covering an area in excess of 65 million hectares, um, and that it makes up to about... Uh, over 44 per cent of the uh, the national reserve system and one thing I want to say is that um, when I talk about uh, being funded for this program I think that we need to recognize that it's not a grants program it's not a bit of a handout for indigenous communities indigenous communities contribute in their land for the for the benefit uh, of, of all Australians in particular for the biodiversity values but also the cultural heritage values uh, the Indigenous Ranger projects were first funded in 2007-2008. They were actually called the uh, uh, Working on Country Program uh, and they were devised as part of what, what uh, the Australian Government uh, uh, Program, which was closing the gap, to trying to reduce those, those uh, social indicators, over-representation uh, over in justice uh, situations poor health, uh, bad education results. I'm sure they're similar stories to here, unfortunately, uh, but it was, it was a program that was put in place to create meaningful employment, career pathways uh, in, for, for Indigenous people in land and sea management. Um, there's a there's video, short video coming up soon, it'll explain this in better detail, but we have in the Indigenous Rangers program, uh, the equivalent of 830 full-time positions. And I think currently we have about 2,600 or there about people employed uh, throughout the country on the program. Uh, some full-time, some part-time and, and some casual uh, employment as well. And uh, the social indicators uh, for the Indigenous Protected Areas program indicate that, you know, it's a, a $3.40 return on investment for every dollar that's... Uh, uh, invested within the within the program. Uh, indigenous protected areas, as I said, 65 in excess of 65 million hectares, um, and uh, we, uh, we that 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 number is just increasing. Just recently, the, the government announced uh, an extension to the program, um, and uh, we we hope that uh, there'll be there'll be some more. We expect that. Um, Indigenous protected areas will cover more than 50% of the national, what they call the National Reserve System, within a couple of years. Uh, here, here's the video that's uh, that's going to play in a moment. I just have to give a warning, particularly for the Premier being here, that we had no control over what the presenter said at the end of this. So I'll uh, I'll absolve myself of all responsibility here, but. Uh, um, it's a, it, it's a national, national television program in Australia. Uh, I think it tells a, a great story. If I can get it, go on. Oop, hang on. What have I done? Oh. Indigenous policy in Australia has a long history of failures, but we do have one world-leading success story on our hands. Deep in the stone country of Western Arnhem Land is one of Australia's most remote communities. 
How about this Wodega country? And this is the home, this is where we live, we work, and we're here to look after our land. Unlike most isolated areas where more than 60% of Aboriginal Australians are unemployed, here nearly everyone has a job. And with a well-attended school, happy and healthy people, and no crime to speak of, it's a genuine Indigenous success story. And it's based on one very simple fact. People need country, and country need people. You know, because country look after us, and we look after country. Without people to manage it, this country would be at the mercy of rampant wildfires, feral animals and noxious weeds. But the federal government's Indigenous Rangers program funds men and women to care for the country using both traditional knowledge and modern technology. As blackfellas in remote communities, this is the stuff we do. We've been doing it for tens of thousands of years. Nobody does it better than us. It's a lot of work, non-stop. You know, people might think that we're just sitting down and happily doing our work, but no. We are, we are on top of it. Almost all of these rangers are either in their first job or have transferred out of welfare. And as their ancestors did thousands of years ago, they used strategic burning to prevent devastating large-scale fires. If you believe the country is unburned for it of 10 years, someone will come and throw matches and that's it. It's like a fertilizer. We burn this country so that, you know, it's come back really good. Over the past decade, this careful use of fire has dramatically reduced the number and severity of wildfires and prevented the release of nearly 2 million tonnes of greenhouse gases. The gas giant ConocoPhillips pays ranger groups about $1.5 million a year to offset its carbon emissions. This is real work. This is real outcomes. Uh, this, is, this is like a real business and that has more than business outcomes, it has pride in the community and they're actually delivering a service to the government and to the Australian people. That service also includes culling thousands of buffalo and other feral animals and painstakingly cataloguing hundreds of ancient rock art sites. This place called Wildalong Yellow, where people used to paint kangaroo, wallaby, turtle. This is um, Tasmania Tiger, and we call it Chandel. This animal, I didn't see it, my grandfather didn't see it, but it's here. Waterkin is just one of more than 70 Indigenous Protected Areas, or IPAs, that cover a total of 65 million hectares and employ more than 2,600 people. A government commissioned report found that every dollar spent on the IPA and Ranger programs generates about $3 in environmental, economic and cultural returns. Another report found that in one group of remote communities, Ranger jobs led to 15,000 fewer nights in lockup and 1,150 fewer alcohol-related criminal incidents. I see these as real jobs, real constructive jobs that are contributing uh, not only to the Indigenous community and, uh, and to the culture of those communities as well as the environment, but also to Australia as, as a whole. You know, we should look at this as, uh, you know, as a long-term process. But despite the enormous success of the programs, the government hasn't committed to them long-term. Current funding arrangements end in June 2018, and so far there's only been a verbal commitment to extend just the Ranger program to 2020. We should be thinking 10, 20 years, not wondering about a few years' time whether we'll continue funding, and we should be expanding it, um, because we're on a winner here and we need to stick with it. Malcolm Turnbull asked me what are three things that we can do to make a difference on the Indigenous policy landscape, and I told him, firstly, acknowledge, embrace and celebrate the humanity of Indigenous Australians. Secondly, bring us policy approaches that nurture hope and optimism rather than entrench despair. And lastly, do things with us, not to us. Now here's a program that ticks all of those three boxes. For its part, the Waterkin community is fully committed to living, learning and working on country. We want our children to learn both ways, to learn our traditional knowledge and culture, plus we want them to learn about a uh, Western kind of uh, education as well. So lots of children out in the community and out in here say, I want to be a ranger, I want to be a ranger. <laughs> so that's a good sign. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. this program is so successful that even thinking about doing it in Canada, that sounds it's just so good. Like, Indigenous culture is an asset. We spent too much time trying to talk about it just communities. Shame, John. It's not an asset. Asset to be recognised. Exactly. 
Like, anyway. That's it for the show. Great Thank you very much for having us. We have no control, trust me. Dean, who was on the on, on that video, uh, was with the delegation uh, over here, and uh, David Ross also from uh, the Central Land Council in Alice Springs. Uh, David left Alice Springs. I think the, da the temperature was 47 plus that day. Uh, we got out to Yellowknife a couple of days later, and it was minus 42 <laughs> out on the lake. Uh, we did have a bit of adjusting to do, but uh, it, was, it was great. I don't think Premier, you uh, missed our, our presentations because of the, the snow. I've Never have that much trouble getting to work, you know, with snow and whatever. But this week, <laughs> um, I'm just going to flick through a few slides of some of the work that the Rangers do. Aaron will talk about that, but I want to stop at a couple just to make a couple of points. Um, some of the Ranger work, feral animals, weeds, fire, biodiversity, monitoring. We talked, I think people talked about monitoring and uh, cultural heritage management, uh, and the list goes on. Um, I think this is an important slide. This is uh, uh, the Volgan, I'm not sure if I've pronounced that right, ranges uh, up at uh, Larger Manu in, in central Australia, uh, out in the desert country, uh, and, and that's their uh, management committee and also their junior ranges. So, again, uh, they're incorporating youth into their uh, land management projects. I think you've seen that with Wardican as well on that video, that it's, it's a very important part of, of the work. There's some more monitoring, uh, monitoring of work. Uh, some, some, some ladies uh, at, a, uh, again, another IPA management committee. Uh, this is one down home on country. Uh, we have